We're brought here today by the love that Sarah and Davis share for each other. We're going to be so happy. We'll be so happy. I'm gonna crush it at being a husband. I really hope she looks like her picture. Pete says she has a good personality. That's a red flag. Davis! Whoa, that is one beautiful personality. Cutie alert. Thank, Thank you, you, Pete. Pete. <laughs> uh, sorry, I, uh, oh. I got you a latte. Oh. I get? <laughs> Thanks, latte. Why did I just say that? <laughs> Quick, say something. Oh, yeah, that's dairy. Probably shouldn't immediately correct him. Uh, so do you... sports? Failure. Yeah, I love golf. What? No, I don't. I hate golf. Uh, me too. Yes, I love with the chipping and the putting birdies. Nope, oh, tweet tweet. <laughs> Get a hold of yourself. Um, so what are you looking for in, in a relationship? Oh my gosh, I'm gonna die alone. Uh, oh. Um, you know, it's, uh, um... Someone just like me. Someone who's just kind of their own person. Someone pretty adventurous. Someone who likes to stay at home. Someone who'll just listen to me. Someone who doesn't talk too much. Someone who isn't intimidated by how much money I make. Somebody who doesn't mind how little money I make. He looks like a good dad. Hope she doesn't want kids, like, soon. Um, you know, it's, uh, like another... person. Oh, that's me. I mean, me too. <laughs> <laughs> I think I love her. Wow, time flew by. <laughs> it's over? Think fast. Oh, yeah, oh, yes. Yeah. Um, you gotta, uh, do you want me to, huh. maybe... Should I give her a hug? Is that weird? No. <laughs> Okay. No, kiss. Ha okay. No, wait. Oh my gosh, what do I do? S uh, this is great. What is this happening? <laughs> <laughs> Go. Okay. Ooh, he smells good. <laughs> well, I'll just see you. Well, you messed that up. It's okay. We'll crush our second date. <laughs> Man, I'm so glad that I don't have to do that anymore, you know? Um, Welcome to Grace Fellowship. We are so glad that you're here today. We are in the middle of a series called Crushing It. And our desire is that, that you and your marriage relationship, and actually in every relationship, you are crushing it and not being crushed by it. So uh, I get the chance today to kind of continue on the series. We're going to be wrapping it up next week. And, and uh, it's just been a great series for me. Hopefully, if you did not see the previous two weeks, I'd encourage you to go back and watch those. Um, but one of the things we ask periodically around here as a staff and as pastors and just in the, in the culture we're in is, um, what breaks your heart? And, um, and I got to thinking the thing that breaks my heart is struggling marriages. It's, it's marriages that are not um, bringing joy to the, to the person's life, to the couple's life. It's, it's marriages that are maybe just, uh, just settling for mediocrity. Um, a couple of weeks ago, Ted Lowe, which spoke, he started off the series, and he's been here several times, and one of the previous times he had been and shared at the church, one of the things he talked about is kind of a pet peeve of his, is that um, when older couples or couples that have been married for a little longer come up to a, a couple that is not married yet or just about to get married or, they're, or they have been married but just a real short period, and they walk up and they say, whew, marriage is a lot of work, hope you're ready for that. And uh, it's kind of like, wow, that's kind of depressing. You know, you think about it. And, and uh, because it is, it is, it's not that we're saying that marriage is not a lot of work, but it almost comes across sound like, oh, it's just no fun. It's just like a ball and chain. As soon as you get married, you spend the rest of your life just trying to keep your head above water and there's really nothing to look forward to. And, and I don't think that's the way God intended marriage to be. I, I really feel like God intended marriage to be enjoyable, um, that it's a gift given to us. Um, and, and I know for, for me, marriage is a blast. I love being married to my wife. I love spending time with her. I love waking up in the morning and, and seeing her there. There's never been a morning in 28 plus years of marriage that I've rolled over in bed and I've looked and like, oh, she's still here. <laughs> you know, it's just, it's just not, I don't, I don't do that. I don't, I don't leave work in the afternoon and, and try to figure out something I can do when I get home to keep me outside so I don't have to come in and spend time with her. Uh, and, and in fact, all of us have this idea that that's what we want in our marriage relationship. We, we, don't, we don't stand across from each other getting married and say, I hope I'm going to have an average marriage. I hope that this is going to be mediocre. We all have this desire and this expectation to have an amazing marriage. We, we want that. And it's not that we're lacking desire. It's really that we're kind of lacking follow through. 
We're, we're missing it somewhere. We start off hoping this is going to be an amazing thing, and eventually somewhere down the line, we just settle. I know that uh, when I was in high school, I had uh, uh, a chance my senior year in high school, which was a very long time ago, by the way. Um, my senior year in high school, I had the chance to really have a great senior s- season in track. And, um, and I sat down with my coach, Coach Moss. We sat down at the beginning of the year, and we set some goals. We wrote them down on paper. And, uh, and there was quite a few goals because goals build on each other. But the two biggest goals was I wanted to win state, and I wanted to set a state record. And, uh, and, but here's the deal. We had a desire. We, had a, we wanted to do it. But then we had to figure out a plan to make it happen. And, and so we continue to pr- continue the process, and we talk through what it's going to take to get there. And one of the things is I started running cross country to build kind of a foundation. I changed my diet, um, and I need to do that again, by the way. Um, I changed my diet, and I started walking home every day from school um, at lunch to eat better, eat healthier food. And, and then we also started, I started a process when track season started every Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, running about a mile and a half every morning, not just kind of get out and leisure running, but actually running pretty hard. And then, and then on those days in the afternoon, I did 1,200s on Mondays, I did 1,000s on Tuesdays, and I did 800s on Wednesdays, and, and then I worked with a sprint relay. And it's kind of crazy that I can still remember that. I can't remember my birthday, but I can remember that. And, um, and, and, and then we worked on that, and then I got shin splints in the process, so we got woke up 30 minutes earlier every day, and my parents treated my shin splints, went to therapy, and all this other stuff. And, and, and here's the deal. I had a desire to win. We put a plan together, but that wasn't enough either. I had to actually implement the plan. I had to put it together. I had to actually begin to do something with it. And here's the deal. Nothing in life ever happens without some work. Nothing good ever happens. I mean, maybe periodically, maybe some good stuff that happens every now and then just by happenstance. But for the reality, we got to work at it, don't we? We've got to put some effort into it. But we don't think about that with our marriage. We think it's just a supposed to happen. If, if, if we find that special person, you know what I'm saying? If we find that special person, then it's marital bliss. And if there's not, if we don't experience the marital bliss, then it's, we got to do either we got to trudge through the relationship and just settle for mediocrity, or we got to start shopping around and find another one, which is what we do a lot of times. We're always looking for that next person that's going to bring satisfaction into us. We, we look and we look and we look. And, and I'll just be honest with you guys. Um, it doesn't happen. You don't find that perfect person. Now, my wife did 28 years ago. <laughs> but after me, I'm sorry. Uh, we, we never argue over the remote control. We never argue over the thermostat. We, we never get in heated discussions about how we're going to spend our money or how we're going to spend our time. Um, we, we never argued about how to parent. Um, yeah, we just, we always just had everything just always worked out perfect for us. And if you believe that, my wife was in the first service and she actually threw something at me. I'm kidding. She didn't, but that's what we expect, isn't it? Isn't that what we expect in our marriage relationship? We think it's supposed to be perfect. We think everything's supposed to go great and we're never supposed to have arguments and we're never supposed to work through conflict and we're never supposed to deal with anything like that because we have this crazy expectation that if we find that perfect person, then everything's going to just work out. And that's not the reality we live in. And so what happens is this, we settle. We settle for mediocrity. We settle for just existing in the relationship instead of putting together a plan and working to make that relationship better. So what is the key to making a marriage relationship beyond mediocrity? And I think Chris hit on it last week in a huge way. And if you were here, you know what I was talking about. But if you didn't, I want you to go back and listen to it because it really, it was foundational for marriage, but it was foundational in every relationship. And this is what he said, to build a healthy we, we must start, I must start with me. If I'm going to have a healthy relationship with my spouse, it doesn't begin with what she needs to do. It begins with what I need to do. It begins with me. So I ask you this question this morning. I want you to think about this. This is the question I want you to answer. How is me? How are you? How are you doing in your relationship? How are you doing in the relationship that you have right now? We don't like this question. We don't like this question. We would rather point out the issues of our spouse 
or, or the other person in the relationship instead of truly looking in the mirror and saying, okay, there's some issues here. So how is me? And here's the deal that you need to understand and I need to understand constantly, be reminded of, is this. You can control nothing in any relationship other than you. You can't determine what anybody else does. The only thing you can control in a relationship is you. So you need to work at you. If you have your Bibles or phones or tablets, I would encourage you to turn to Ephesians. We're going we're gonna to dive into Ephesians 5 um, this morning together. Um, and as you're looking, let me just kind of lay some groundwork about what Ephesians. Ephesians was a letter that Paul wrote to the church at Ephesus. And Paul was, uh, many of you may know this, we talk about it on often. Paul hated Christianity. He hated anybody that believed in Christ. And he spent part of his life hunting down Christians and putting them in prison, having them killed. And in the process of doing that, he had an encounter with Jesus and it turned his life around. And then he actually became one of the key leaders in the early church and wrote much of the New Testament. And so we're going to read a letter that he wrote to the church at Ephesus. All right. And he's talking about marriages here in Ephesians 5. It says this, and in further, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Okay. Now here's the deal. Um, this is when Ted spoke, he talked about how we need to, there's actually a competition going and the competition is to outserve each other. It's to mutually submit to the other person, to outserve them, compete to get to the end of the line. Um, and, and this is easy to do, easier to do, not easy to do. This is easier to do when both of you are joining in the process. But when both of you are not joining in the process, it makes it extremely difficult. And that's where the tension is. The tension is how do I mutually submit? Why should I mutually submit if they're not holding up their end of the bargain? And I want you to understand this. If they're not holding up their end of the bargain, that does not relieve you of the responsibility to submit to them. You still have a responsibility to serve them and to go above and beyond and outserve them. We don't like that in our culture. But that's what that verse talks about. And then he continues on in Ephesians. He says, for wives, submit to, the, submit to your husbands as to the Lord. For a husband is head of his wife as Christ is head of the church. He is the savior of his body, the church. As the church submits to Christ, so you wives should submit to your husbands in everything. Okay? And, and we have mixed emotions about that verse, don't we? About that passage. Some of you in here are going, I ain't really listening to that. Some of y'all are elbowing your wife. I told you so. But here's the deal. When you're looking at this passage, it's talking about mutual submission. It's already prefaced it by saying you mutually submit to each other. Now, this is how you do it. And they talk to the wives, and this is how you do it as a wife. Now, this, nowhere in this passage does it say that the man is the boss, and you've got to do what he says. And, and, and we've misused this verse for years, this passage for years. And if, and if you're using this verse, this passage in that way, then you're misusing this scripture. This is not talking about having a subservient wife. You are still a connect, you are still on the same level. Okay? But it's talking to the wife, and this is how you can mutually submit. This is how you can love your spouse is to show respect and honor towards them. Then it goes on to say this. For husbands, this means love your wives just as Christ loved the church. He gave up his life for her. All right? Here's the deal with that. Wives are supposed to respect and honor. This is talking about husbands, you need, to respect, you need to love your wife like Christ loved the church. And how did he love the church? He gave himself up for her. He gave himself up for her. Not, not, there's not, most of us in here would say, oh, I'll take a bullet for my wife. Yes, I would, maybe if it ever came to that point. I hope it never does. But, but this is not what that's talking. It's talking more about, will you die to yourself every day? Will you die to your selfish agenda every day so that you can love your spouse? just like Christ loved the church. And then it says, he gave up his life for her. Go back, I'm sorry, I didn't read all that. He gave up his life for her to make her holy and clean, washed by the cleansing of God's word. He did this to present her to himself as a glorious church without a spot or wrinkle or any other blemish. Instead, she will be holy and without fault. Next. 
In the same way, husbands ought to love their wives as they love their own bodies. For as a man who loves his wife actually shows love for himself, no one hates his own body, but feeds and cares for it, just as Christ cares for the church and we are members of his body. So there's, there's, a, there's a common thread all the way through this passage. And I don't know if you saw that. There's a common thread that takes us through this passage. And that common thread is a comparison between the marriage relationship between a man and a woman and the relationship between Christ and the church. And, and I, I want you to hear me say this. Marriage is a gift. It's not just a gift to me and my spouse to be married together. But marriage is a gift to the world. Marriage is a gift to the world because what, the way God set it up, the reason God gave us marriage is so the world could see, the world could see a walking example of how Christ loves the church. So your marriage relationship is a gift to you, but also a gift to everyone else that you come in contact with. And that's one of the reasons, guys, that's one of the reasons that God sees marriage as so important is because it's not just another relationship in your life. It is a marriage relationship. It is a relationship that is a representation of Christ's love for us as his church. And he wants us to look at it that way. And that's another reason why I do not believe that God gave us marriage to trudge through and just accept and exist. He wants us to enjoy that relationship. Now, there's two things that he talks about in here. He talks about submission and he talks about love. Love is something that we don't mind talking about every now and then. We don't mind talking about love. We struggle in actually doing it most of the time. But man, when we talk about submit, we do not like that word at all. And we definitely don't want to talk about it. But love and submit is really just a picture of how we can mutually submit to each other, how we can serve each other. What he's called us to do in verse 21 is to serve one another and to outserve each other. Look at verse 31. It says, and the scripture says, a man leaves his father and mother and is joined to his wife and the two are united into one. Okay, this is what um, Chris talked about last week, united into one. When you get married, you become one. You become one relationship, all right? And then it continues on. This is the great mystery, but it is an illustration of the way Christ and the church are one. So again, I say, each man must love his wife as he loves himself, and the wife must respect her husband. Okay, it's talking about two things here in this passage. It's telling us how do we do this? How do we mutually submit? It's talking about two things. It's saying the wife needs to respect her husband, and the husband needs to love his wife. Now, here's the catch. Are you ready for this? As a husband, my natural tendency is to respect. And my wife cries out for love. And as a wife, your natural tendency is to love. You have that loving, caring nature. And the husband requires respect. You know what that tells me? We're different. And if, if, you are, if you didn't already know that, we need to set up a class, okay? But we're different. And because we are different, our relationship with each other does not come natural. It doesn't just happen. Great marriages don't just happen. You have to work at it. Marriage is not all work, but it's not all fun. It's a mixture of both. And for me, I believe you need to work at making it fun. So, what does that look like? What does that look like for us? How in the world, how in the world can we take a marriage from mediocrity to above mediocrity? How can we take a marriage that's actually enjoyable? How can we love our spouse or respect our spouse when they're not helping us, when they're not making the process easy? And I believe it goes back to Ephesians 5.21, the very first verse we read. And further, submit to one another, look at this, out of reverence for Christ. Out of reverence for Christ. Even when your spouse is not helping you, even when your spouse is not pulling their weight and making it easy for you to mutually submit and to love and respect them, even when they're not pulling their end of the bargain, you do it anyhow. 
out of reverence for Christ. Because of your relationship with Jesus, you're able to love and respect even when they're not giving you a reason to. That's what this is talking about. And I'll tell you this, and I have a good marriage. Sometimes that's hard. Sometimes I would say, honestly, I would say it's impossible. It's impossible for us to pull that off and do what, what is required of us according to the scripture. And let me tell you the one, here, here's the catch. This is the way that you do it. This is the, if you don't hear anything else, here we go. You ready? This is the way you do it. Jesus. Jesus. Jesus is the way that, that, that we can have that kind of relationship. Now, I, I live with a filter that I, Jesus is my, I have a relationship with Jesus, okay? And he filters at the way I see life, the way I see relationships, the way I see everything is filtered through my relationship with him. And I believe that if your relationship with Jesus is where it needs to be, then it gives you the ammunition to make sure that your marriage can be above mediocre. Apart from Jesus, I don't think you can have an amazing marriage. I think, yeah, you can have a good one. I'm not going to say you can't have a good one. But just think if you had Jesus at the core, how amazing it would be. Because for me, Jesus created me. Jesus made me. He understands me. And the cool thing is, is he made my wife and he understands her. And he's going to help us understand each other if we let him. So how do we do this? Look at Philippians. Paul wrote this, and he's not, he's not talking to the, a married couple. He's talking to people in general, okay, Christians in general. He says, don't be selfish. Don't try to impress others. Be humble, thinking of others as better than yourselves. Don't look out only for your own interest, but take an interest in others. You must have the same attitude that Christ Jesus had. All the way through that, you know what it's telling us to do? To not be selfish, to look at our relationships, every relationship, not with a me focus, but a them focus. And then he caps it off by saying we need to have the same attitude that Jesus Christ had. And Jesus' attitude was this. Even those that were screaming and spitting on him, he still walked to the point of his death. He died on a cross for everybody in this room. He died on the cross for everybody, even those that would never come to the point where they actually believed he was Jesus, but he still did it. You want to know how you can be a spouse like that? You need Jesus. You need to have the same attitude of Christ. You need to have that same focus. That's a pretty high standard, isn't it? So how can you and I do that? How can, we can, how can we have that kind of focus in our relationship? And Paul talks about this in Galatians. He, he re, read this with me. My old self has been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. Let me just kind of share, share this part real quick with you, okay? Inside of me, I have a sinful nature. Whenever I gave my life to Jesus, that sinful nature was killed. It was crucified on the cross. It's gone. You want to know how I can have a, have a better relationship with my wife is when I crucify my selfish nature. So I live in this earthly body by trusting in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. You want to know how you can have a relationship where you can live inside of a selfish world in a selfless way? It begins by having Jesus Christ in your life giving Jesus Christ access to you and allowing him to take your sinful selfishness and crucify it and get rid of it and quit letting it come back. I believe that the most important relationship, the best thing you can do for your marriage relationship in any relationship is putting Jesus Christ at the core of that relationship. When you put him in the center, when you make him the foundation, Every other relationship has the potential to be amazing, to be amazing. So my question for you, where is Jesus in your relationship? Where is Jesus in your life? If you're still asking questions, allow us to help you. Allow us to answer some questions. If you're watching online, let the person hosting you, let them know. If you're here, come by the hub. We'd love to kind of begin the process to let you know 
Because the most important decision, the most important relationship for your marriage is Jesus. So let's, let's take a, let's real quick, let's dive into some practical elements of what does this look like. And these practical elements from, come from a book I read, okay? Um, and you may have read this book. This book revolutionized my marriage, all right? And it's called The Five Love Languages by Gary Chapman. If you've never read it or if it's been a couple of years since you read it, I would encourage you to read it again. Um, but, and it also has ones for marriages. It has ones on raising kids and raising students. It's, it's kind of a, a, a great thing, okay? But it's The Five Love Languages. And here's the deal. Even with The Five Love Languages, you're going to have to work at it. You're going to have to die to yourself. You're going to have to quit being selfish and begin to speak the language of your spouse. Lay some groundwork for what this looks like. There's three things I want you to see. We all have an emotional love tank. We all have an emotional love tank. What does that mean? We all have a tank inside of us that is, needs to be filled with love. All right? And I know the guys are going, oh, this is stupid. Okay? But just work with me. All right? Okay. There, everybody has a, a, a tank inside them that needs to be filled with love. And, and we find that, we find how to fill that emotional love tank from different places. Just like a car, if you're driving your car and that orange light camp comes on and your car actually says how many miles, that's a, by the way, that's just kind of a suggestion that says how many miles you can go, you're looking for a gas station, aren't you? You're looking for a gas station. Um, in, a, in a marriage relationship, the emotional love tank, when that emotional love tank gets low, people start looking for gas stations to fill that love tank. And we don't always look in the place that we need to look. We don't always look in the place that we need to look to first. And this is why in premarital counseling, a lot of times I call this a fair proof in your marriage. You're trying to set it up where, it's, where your marriage is a fair proof, so you're the one filling up that emotional love tank. Next thing is this. We all have a language that fills our emotional love tank. Every one of us, there's five love languages. We're going to talk about them here in just a few minutes, but you're going to have to listen very quickly. Okay, we're going to talk about all five of them. Um, you have a primary and a secondary as a, an adult. If you're a kid or a student, you probably need all five of them for right now. All right, but you have a primary and a secondary, and it's our responsibility to, to speak that language into our spouse, which leads me to the next one. Our spouse's emotional love tank is our responsibility. Listen to me, husbands, husbands, me. It's your responsibility to speak the language that your wife understands so you can fill up her emotional love tank. Wives, same thing. It's your responsibility to speak your husband's love language to fill up his love tank. The danger is whenever we're not, they'll find it somewhere else. Still wrong on their part, but wouldn't it be a whole lot easier if we helped them wouldn't it be a lot easier to help them in their marriage relationship, in our marriage relationship, by fulfilling that part? So let's do this. I want us to look at the five love, the five love language real quick: quality time, physical touch, words of affirmation, acts of service, and receiving gifts. All right, these are the five love languages. I would encourage you on the, the QR code, you can scan that with your phone, and it'll take you to a point on that link tree that you can actually take the test. Okay, and I would encourage you as a couple to take it. There's also one for kids to take. You can take that and, and help, you, help you out because it's hard enough for us to understand when we know the facts of what we need to do. But you need to find, you can take that test and talk about it at lunch or anything. So I'd encourage you to do that, all right? So let's kind of break it down real quick. The first one is quality time. Quality time. This is just spending time together. This is spending time together. Last week, um, we, me and my wife hosted uh, the break weekend. Uh, we had um, uh, freshman guys at our house. And we got home about, I got home about 1245 on Sunday. And we have a life group that meets in our house on Sunday night. So I'm looking at the house and I'm thinking, holy cow, we got to get some, we got to clean this house up a little bit. So I'm cleaning up. I ate lunch and I start cleaning up and everything. My wife's sitting in the recliner and she said, hey, just come and sit down, sit down. And I'm like, no, baby, we got to get the house clean. Got to get the house clean. And a little bit later, she goes, hey, let's go take a nap. I'm like, no, I got to get the house clean. I got to get the house. Okay, I took the hint, guys, after two. You know what she was wanting? She was wanting me to stop and spend quality time with her. So I went and sat down in the recliner for a little bit, and we went and took a nap, and then we got up, and we finished cleaning the house. But I was completely oblivious to what she was crying for. Quality time. If your spouse's love language is quality time, they're longing for time with you. 
Now, my language is quality time, but my language is I like to be with her, hanging out with her, going shopping with her, going some places with her. Some people have the, the dialect that they like to be sitting across from a table engaged eyeball to eyeball, okay? They want to be looking. They want to be having conversations with you. That's the quality time they're looking for. You got to figure that out. That's the challenge, okay? What is their dialect? Now, here's the, here's the, here's the hang up. Here's the hard part. If they're not getting quality time at home, if, if you're so busy working or if y'all are so busy chasing kids or doing hobbies and all that kind of stuff and you're not getting the quality time at home or your spouse is not getting the quality time at home and they go to work or they go to school or something like that and all of a sudden somebody shows them time, they just soak it up. They just soak it up. They're not looking for it, but all of a sudden it shows up and the next thing you know, they're longing for that quality time. If they do that, that's wrong, but can't we help them? The next one's physical touch. Physical touch, we think about physical touch, a lot of times we think that's just, uh, that's sex. And, and that's a dialect, but there's so much more to it. It's, it's holding hands. It's giving your spouse a kiss before you leave for work. It, it's, it's giving them a hug when you come home. It's sitting on the couch and you actually touching legs on each other. It doesn't have to be all about sex all the time. Physical touch is just having the presence of somebody there where you can feel them. I love walking into the grocery store holding my wife's hand. 28 years of marriage, I still love, and hold, love holding her hand. Physical touch is one of my languages. I love that. But do you see the scary part of this? If, if, if you're home and, and you're not getting your, the physical touch that you require and all of a sudden you go to work and somebody walks up to you and puts their hand on your shoulder and it's just like, <sighs> they weren't looking for it, but it felt because they need that language spoken to them. And I'll, I'll tell you, there's, there's a danger here. Kids are a danger to physical touch. If you have preschoolers or young elementary, this is one of the hardest things to do is because you're so emotionally spent and tired and you got kids running in the room all the time and stuff like that. It makes it difficult. But that doesn't relieve you of the responsibility to speak their language. And let me throw this in there. I may get thrown, I'm, I think I almost got thrown out of the service in the first service. I'm going to say this. I'm going to try to say it a little nicer though. One of the greatest dangers to your marriage relationship, if you have a spouse that speaks physical touch, is allowing the kids to come in and sleep in the middle of you. And I know you want to love them and care for them, and there's a place for that, but you got to understand the kids eventually will be gone, and you will be looking face-to-face to someone that you're supposed to spend the rest of your life with, and you don't know who they are. Physical touch. Physical touch. The next one is words of affirmation. Words of affirmation, just telling them people, hey, man, you've done a great job. I love what you've done with, the, with your hair. It's great. It looks good. I love that outfit on you. Um, it's, it's, it's speaking words into their life. It, and you, be specific. Don't just say, hey, you look good. I mean, tell them why. You know, be specific. I love how your haircut. I, I, I love what you've done with the yard. The yard looks amazing. Thank you so much. Speaking words of affirmation to them. Now, here's a, here's a danger part of words. And you know this. If words is your language, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Whenever your language, your words is, your language is words, and someone comes in and they ridicule you or they're critical of you or they're sarcastic, it's like taking a knife and just diving it in your heart and just digging it around. Your words can build up your marriage relationship or your words can tear down that relationship so quickly. You've got to understand, you can't just say what's on your mind whenever you want to because you don't care how they feel. It's your responsibility to speak their love language. And you've got to meet that emotional love tank. And if, and if you don't, they're going to find it somewhere else. Parents, kids the same way. If you're constantly telling your kids, you need to do better, you could do better, you missed that ball on the field, I can't believe you got this grade, you need to do this, this, eventually they're going to start believing it. And it's like a knife going in their heart every time. Words of affirmation. The next one is, is acts of service. 
acts of service. Here, here's, here's the one for me. I, I love to speak this language. My wife, it's like on her bottom of the list, okay? But acts of service is going out of your way to serve them. Guys, let me ask you this. When was the last time you took your wife's car and filled it up with gas without them telling you to? Ladies, when was the last time you took your husband's vehicle and got it detailed? When, when was the last time that you served them without being asked to? I, I, I think we have a misunderstanding a little bit in our culture today because <laughs> we think, well, that's a man's job and that's a woman's job. The man's going to take care of the yard, he's going to take care of the cars, and the woman's going to take care of the dishes, Okay. And I hope that's not your marriage because me and my wife are in it together. And, and we may not, she may not ask me to, but sometimes whenever she looks up and I'm unloading the dishwasher, it speaks love into her. It's not one of her primary languages, but it's still encouraging to her. So how are you doing? How are you serving? Are you going out of your way to meet their need? Whatever that looks like. Are you serving them? Are you giving the kids a bath? Are you saying, hey, you take the night off, you go take a bath, sweetheart. I got the kids. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's fun. Okay. The last one's receiving gifts. This is my wife's primary. It was not my wife's primary until about halfway through our marriage at about 14 years. I didn't know it was her primary anymore. I was still living on the old ones. And she quickly let me know that this is her primary again. All right. Um, and and like, by the way, languages change if you don't already know that. Uh, but here's the deal. She's, it's not that I need to buy her a car every year. That's not what she needs. She's not asking for that. She's not asking me to buy her a pair of shoes every week. She would take them, but she's not asking me to do that. What she's looking for is this, a handwritten note I live on her, put on her desk. It's, it's me going to the store and grabbing one of her treats and bringing it home. It's, it's bringing some flowers and giving her flowers even though there's no special occasion. It's giving gifts. And what this means is whenever you give gifts, it's saying, I was thinking about you even when I was not around you. And you are special and you are appreciated. Receiving gifts. Receiving gifts. Speaking the right love language at the right time will take your marriage from mediocre to amazing. It's going to take commitment. It's going to take a plan. And it's going to take you swallowing your pride to make it that way. But I'm promising you this, guys. The gift of marriage that God gave us was never meant to just exist. He wants your marriage to be amazing. So embrace the gift of marriage. Embrace your spouse, your spouse and begin to understand her language and then start speaking it. Start speaking it and then watch what God does with your marriage. Let's pray. God, thank you so much. Thank you for the gift of marriage. Thank you for allowing us to be married. Thank you for the challenge, Lord. Thank you that we can be a walking example to the world around us of your love for us. And Father, I lift up the marriages in this room right now, the ones that are settling. Father, will you create in them a desire to to move forward and to begin to learn each other and to speak their language. And Father, for those that are here right now that have an amazing marriage already, Father, will you help them to be even better? And Father, will you help them to speak into the lives of those that are struggling? Father, thank you so much for your love. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen.